Uh, you're used to seeing Jim Babcock up here, if you've been to any of our talks before, to do the intro, so I am a very uh, inadequate substitute, <laughs> but you got me today. Um, I want to let you know that the Branson Centennial Museum is an affiliate of White River Valley Historical Society, based over in Forsyth, and is a fully uh, not-for-profit, not-government-funded institution to protect the history and celebrate the culture of our area. So your donations are always appreciated. We do these talks free of charge mostly to get more of you folks into the museum and to see all the wonderful things that we do here and um, hopefully get involved and, and give us some support. So we do appreciate you coming and we also have the wonderful pleasure of introducing uh, folks in the community who in, are involved in one area of the history and the culture uh, to present uh, on their topic of expertise. And that's what we have for you today with Mr. Robert McCormick, a first-time author, a talented photographer that many of us have followed online for many years as he's discovered the abandoned Ozarks. And um, we had been waiting for months to have Robert come speak until his books were going to be available. And guess what? They're still not quite available. <laughs> but I will explain. <laughs> he'll tell you more about that and more about his adventures and his love of um, all things Ozarks and abandoned and um, how he's collected uh, this amazing work and now has it published and that will soon be available yes. for all. <laughs> okay, please welcome Robert McCoy. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good, because I am a loud talker. By way of explanation, there's a reason why I don't have books, and I think if anybody here has experience with publishing, you will probably understand how this goes as a first-time author and publisher. I, uh, as a lot of you know, I've had abandoned Ozarks photography online, a couple social media outlets for mm, close to 10 years, if not longer. And they've been pretty popular. Uh, the, the Facebook page has 10,000 likes and 10,000 followers. And I've got, it's, it's pretty worldwide. I, my demographics show that I have of people in other countries. It's international. And that just goes to show you how much interest there really is in Ozark's culture and heritage. There's a lot of people that are really interested in what's going on here. And I, uh, was contacted by an imprint called Font Hill Media. And Font Hill is uh, a subsidiary of a much larger and reputable um, <laughs> publisher called Arcadia. And they specialize in a lot of history books, a lot of military history, airplane books, and then they do regional studies. And Font Hill in particular has a a series that's called Abandoned Union, and they contacted me and asked if I would be interested in being a part of this series with my work, and of course I said yes, and they offered a multi-book deal, and uh, which I was surprised as a first-time author. I carefully read the contract, I took it to an attorney, uh, showed it to some other people, and they're like, don't sign this. And uh, so I did sign a one-book deal, uh, because, uh, number one, I wanted to be published, and uh, also, uh, th after looking at it, the royalty rates, there's not, there's, it's almost impossible to make money this way. But I am very interested in perpetuating the history of our culture and heritage here in the Ozarks. And uh, so, Arcadia publishes their books in the United Kingdom. Uh, Apparently, during the pandemic, a lot of the publishing houses in the United States where they do their printing actually went out of business. So, uh, the books, I submitted my manuscript, uh, all of my photographs, everything edited, and put together the way they requested, which took five months to do. Uh, was not easy. I submitted it three weeks before deadline and waited anxiously, as I'm sure you all are, for the books to appear. They launched a pre-sale in August uh, on Target, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and uh, their own website, Arcadia, as well as Thrift Books and, and some other sites. And I know a lot of you have ordered those, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of those, in fact, all of those orders, I think, have been canceled. So uh, I contacted Font Hill, and I'm in my most diplomatic tone and uh, asked what the problem was and it turns out the books were shipped on time 
uh, they are shipped by a shipping container on a ship, as these things go. Uh, it was unloaded in Boston Harbor, and uh, Customs inspects all the containers. Customs flagged the container because it said it had a pest in it. It didn't say what the pest was, if it was a plant, an animal, a bug, whatever it was, but they quarantined the container and asked the shipping company to send it back to the UK. The uh, shipping company said, we don't want to do that. They apparently found an alternate solution to this. Uh, I was notified two weeks ago that the books were cleared to ship. They unloaded the container. And I just found out this morning, thanks to my friend Heather, who <laughs> saw it online, that it is available again uh, on Target. Or uh, not on Target, but on Amazon. Uh, I did a little looking this morning. It's back up on Arcadia. It's back up on Barnes & Noble. So if you want a book, you can go ahead and purchase those today. They will be delivered in time for Christmas. Unfortunately, as the author who was supposed to receive all the books in advance, uh, at least some for me for the purpose of this, uh, I have not received any books or any additional communication from Arcadia or Font Hill or my editor, and uh, so I'm having this event today without books. I will say, however, that if any of you do want something today, uh, if you don't want to order from Target or, or from Amazon or, or any of those guys, I do have a digital copy uh, of the book in my computer uh, that if you prefer to look at these on uh, your computer at home, uh, you can Venmo me or Cash App for 20 bucks, and I'll send it directly to your email box. If you prefer to wait for uh, the books to be delivered, since the retailers do have them, I feel like I will have some. I just don't know what my next event will be. But the books will be for sale at Ozark Mill in Springfield, or in Ozark, uh, Bass Pro in Springfield and Branson. Uh, a couple other retailers here in town are going to have them. Uh, Seasons at Home is going to carry them. Uh, I believe they're going to sell them here. Uh, so there's going to be some options available for you. I just hope I can get them out in time for Christmas. What's the title of the book? Abandoned Ozarks. Abandoned Ozarks. Yeah, Preserving the Past. So I'm going to explain to you kind of how I got into this. Uh, what started out as a hobby began when I was a child. Uh, I grew up in Aurora. I think most of you know where that's at. Uh, my grandparents, when they uh, came home from World War II, bought a little 10-acre spot uh, at a place called Madry, which is about eight miles south of Aurora. And uh, at the back of their property, there was an old schoolhouse that was called Clay Hill School. Uh, and it served most of the kids that lived between Leanne uh, and Aurora. So all the kids around Jenkins and, and some of these rural areas out there attended this school. So as a kid, we used to go back there and play in this abandoned schoolhouse that I didn't really understand why it was abandoned. At that point in the early 70s, when I was seven or eight years old, it looked like any other building. Uh, but there was no access to it. When they consolidated all the rural schools to go into the bigger city schools, uh, a lot of these just were, turned, were just left to rot. Some of them were turned into houses, some of them were turned into barns. Uh, a lot of things were done to him. Nothing was really going on with this schoolhouse. It was just a cool place for us to play when we were kids. Uh, the road that ran right in front of it and through it, which is now fenced off, was a part of the original Butterfield stagecoach line. And uh, so you could go, there, so there's a lot of history there, and I wasn't aware of that at the time either. And right across the road from that schoolhouse, there was an abandoned Civil War cemetery. So, as kids, uh, I took a real interest in school. My sister took a real interest in the cemetery. <laughs> and uh, she, she found out that through her research that, that uh, this was a cemetery of fleeing Confederate soldiers who were wounded and injured and some died on the way from Wilson's Creek on their way south to fight at uh, Prairie Grove. And uh, so they buried these soldiers there, and then they came back later and put these, uh, the, the headstones up. And it's been left to decay. There's nothing there now. And also that schoolhouse is gone. Uh, long story short on that, my sister became a professor of history at Missouri Southern and wrote a book about Civil War uh, history in the Ozarks based on her experiences starting out in that cemetery. And my early life experiences in that schoolhouse led me to this. So uh, that's kind of how I originally got into it. We, 
After I was first married, uh, I had told my wife about that schoolhouse. We'd been to my grandparents. She'd never been back there. Uh, so we took the walk to the back, and uh, it was gone. Uh, and I f felt like I had missed out on sharing a piece of important, not just family history, but, but local history and Ozark history. You know, my grandmother was the school cook there, uh, which is amazing because nobody cooked like grandma. And uh, uh, my mother uh, got her teaching certificate from what was then Missouri State Teachers College by doing her teacher training at Clay Hill School. Uh, so that led me to think about all of the other schoolhouses that were around, and there are, at that point, there were still a lot because you're, we're talking about the late 80s, early 90s. You know, at that point, most of these schools had not been really closed or consolidated until the late 50s or early 60s. So I knew where a lot of them were. So I looked to some inspiration. There's a, a man. Uh, in Springfield, uh, whose name escapes me at this moment, and I've met him a lot of times, but he is a professor at Missouri State University. And he had taken on a project of cataloging all the existing one-room schoolhouses in Greene County. And uh, I was galvanized. It was just the coolest thing to me to look through this and read the history and understand how these schoolhouses worked and how people lived before, you know, everything was consolidated and homogenized into these, into cities and uh, how education was so different at that time. And uh, the thing I did not like was his photographs. Uh, he, 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 a lot of them, it looked like he had just scanned Polaroids that he'd taken from his car window as he drove by. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I don't mean that as an offense to him. I, I, I'm not a highly trained photographer. I, I, I photographed in high school and some in college and you know, as a hobbyist. And uh, I, I just felt like I could I, I felt history in these buildings. I felt romance. I, you know, there's times gone by, and it's just almost so recent that you can reach back and touch it. And especially when there's, they're still there, and you can see them. And a lot of them, you you can go in. So I started researching these buildings and finding ways to go and find them. Uh, Wayfinder, uh, very helpful. Satellite maps that I've used. Uh, White River Valley Historical Society was helpful, uh, Barry County, uh, all the county historical societies that I did researches with uh, were very helpful, the information, and then as I started uh, collecting so many of these pictures, uh, and I know many of you guys knew my late wife Deidre, she was my earliest and most enthusiastic supporter in all of this, she's like, well you need to get these online, people need to see these. So she actually set up the Facebook page and I started posting these pictures and then as these pictures go on you start getting feedback and information from people that see them and that's been really the most gratifying part of all of this. I've posted pictures of some really old schoolhouses and farmhouses and barns and people will inbox me or, or post right on the, the page, you know, the history of it, who owned it, oh I used to live there and oh I had the best time in school there. And, uh, in that way, I have learned more about the history and culture and, uh, of, of the Ozarks than almost anything else that I've done. And it's a great way to be, you know, it's, it's hands-on learning. It was really just a, a wonderful thing. So as the page grew in popularity, we, we discussed um, the possibility of doing a book. And uh, I was not sure how to approach that. I had never published before. Uh, we talked about maybe self-publishing. I discussed maybe we should do some calendars first. Then I was approached uh, by the director of the Center for Ozark Studies uh, at Missouri State University who publishes Ozark's Watch Magazine and they asked if I'd be interested in doing a feature edition and I said, well, yeah. It's, uh, and that issue is available on back order. You have to special order it. I know that they have them in stock. I've got just a very few copies that I kept for myself and my family, but uh, every picture in that issue was one of mine. And that issue centered on one-room schoolhouses in the Ozarks. Um, and that's how uh, I became acquainted with Caitlin McConnell. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with her and her work with uh, uh, Ozarks Alive, which has become a national sensation for people that are interested in Ozarks culture and history. And uh, if you have not 
uh, found Ozarks Alive on social media or that website, you need to check it out because it is, is really one of the best things out there if you're interested in, in the history of our area. So she had a, an article in that, all of my pictures were in that, and the guy's name, now I remember, Dave Burton. <laughs> David Burton was the guy who did that, all that nice work in Greene County, and he also uh, had a hand in that issue. So I was able in that way to get acquainted with some other people who are dedicated and interested in the preservation of our Ozarks history and, and culture. And uh, then the page continued to grow in popularity. And uh, over time, uh, I expanded from schoolhouses because I would find myself driving to these locations uh, and when you're on the way there, you might see this great old store building or a bank building or this incredible farmhouse that looks like it could be haunted and has gingerbread, you know, decorations in it. And then uh, barns became a thing. I uh, had seen a lot of barn uh, calendars and things like that. And then I got interested in barn architecture and, you know, I learned about Dutch gambrel roofs and prairie barns and all these different kinds of barns that are out there and I just kept taking pictures and taking pictures and taking pictures and uh, my wife had to buy a couple of external hard drives because I was clogging up our computer with all the pictures I was saving and uh, by the time I got to the point where I was asked to do this book I would say I had in the neighborhood of 18,000 uh, wow. photographs and they're not all different some of them are because I will shoot multiple angles and, uh, and things like that. And then a lot of these pictures aren't edited because I'll go back and sometimes when you take a second look at one, you might see something you didn't see the first time. And it becomes uh, fun to go back and edit those pictures. And it's like this one. Uh, this is called Haley. And that's the end of the <laughs> it's, called, uh, it's called Haley Schoolhouse. This one is in Barry County and it's uh, pretty close to Shell Knob. And uh, there it is. Uh, I know, isn't that a good one? That was built in 1902, and uh, this is the south side, so as you know, a lot of these school has a, would put all of their windows on the south side. Uh, and then the chalkboard would be on the opposite side, so they had that natural light all day. If you see this building from the other side, there's, no, there's not a window on there. So the point being, I, I, I took multiple shots of this. And uh, as I was working with my editor on the book, they would look at these different uh, angles and shots and colors and decide on the one that they wanted, which was often not the one that I wanted. Uh, it, it's, it's the same thing with this. I uh, uh, got an, uh, an agreement from uh, Bass Pro Shop to sell these at the Ozark Mill, which is where my day job is. And I'd taken this picture quite a few years before Johnny Morris had he had purchased it, he owned it. He bought this actually right when the mill closed in 1993. Um, and I said, I want this on the cover because they're gonna sell it in that store. At that time, I didn't have any other agreements with anybody and I wasn't sure how it was gonna sell. And they said, no, they, uh, they picked out a picture of a schoolhouse. They were really more interested in the, in the schoolhouses. And I, in fact, uh, a, a second liaison editor I had there asked if I would be interested in doing a book of just schoolhouses, which is something that may, happen down the road. Uh, there are plans for a second book. It's going to be called Abandoned Ozarks 2. Very creative. And, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, and it's going to be northwest Arkansas. And I have uh, probably equal or even more photographs that I've taken down in northwest Arkansas uh, that are just, um, to me, they're, they're, they're going to be better than this book. Uh, doing your first book is I learned a lot. Uh, it's definitely a learning process. Uh, as I said, uh, sometimes the disagreements with uh, the editors are such that you don't get to do it the way you want or maybe the vision you have in your head for what your book is going to look like. And uh, that's kind of the way it, it came out with me. I, uh, that once I received this copy and kind of gone through it, I uh, understand now why they do things the way they do. Uh, but it was difficult for me to kind of let my babies go out into the world like that and, and, and not in the way that I had envisioned. Nevertheless, I'm extremely grateful to them uh, for, for doing this. So uh, this book has been broken out into uh, chapters by subject matter. So the entire first chapter is uh, 
and I'm sorry, these, this is the way my, that I can reduce this. So the way that this, you see these pictures, these are laid out in exactly the form that you will see them when you buy the book. This book it doesn't even look like a schoolhouse. It just looks like an old house, but that is the Liberty Schoolhouse. It's close to Jenkins, Missouri, built in 1911. This was built in 1898. This was a big, uh, bigger than a one-room school. That building still stands in Stott City, Missouri. And uh, so anyway, this building, uh, this was the Cedar Creek School, District Number 16. Uh, that building is gone since I took that picture. A spring storm knocked it out completely. A lot of you guys who are local to here will recognize the Mincy School, uh, which is down past Kirbyville. This building still stands and is still in use as a community center. They have weddings, and it's, I think it's still a polling station. But that's uh, that's a very well preserved uh, piece right there. Uh, this is another one that has local history here in uh, Taney County. Who knows what this is? Garber. You know, have you been up there? Uh-huh. This yeah. is cool. There's actually still pages out of school books inside this. If you look at this one closely, you can see where there was a porch right here on the entrance. So how many of you guys know why there's two doors on a school? Boys and girls. That's right. The boys used to go in one side and the girls used to go in on the other side. Uh, but this is part of what is now a new state park, and I don't know that we have access to that yet. It's not open to the public yet, but they say fall of 2024. Fall of next year. That's good yeah. news because this is a great piece of preserved history here. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know about Barber, it is a real ghost town. And uh, Silver Dollar City was actually based on Garber. Uh, Ike, tell me Ike's last name. Uh, Levi Morrill, Uncle Levi Ike. Morrill, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Levi Morrill's house, which was on the National Register of Historic Places, which I also have a picture of in this book, is gone now. Mm. Uh, he was a uh, postmaster at Notch, but he lived near Garber. There was uh, the postmistress's name was Ada Klotfelter. Mm -hmm. You know that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I love a fellow historian here. Uh, but when the Hershens first came down here and visited Garber, they got this idea in their head of about how we, why don't we have this 1880s type town that's in the Ozarks just like Garber. And uh, of course Garber's long by the wayside, you can't really access it unless you cut through uh, the railroad tracks or uh, Stone, Ridge. Stone Ridge. Yeah, you have to drive past, past their maintenance shed and take a little walk. But there are some cool buildings still out there. and. Uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of these little historical places in the Ozarks that people uh, don't know about or have forgotten about. This is another Taney County school right here. This is called McCarty. Uh, this is a Stone County school, which is one of the great examples of Giraffe Rock. I know a lot of you guys are familiar with Giraffe Rock architecture, which is an interesting story in itself. In fact, I was just at the Ozark Symposium in West Plains where a guy came and did a presentation just on this this, uh, uh, and, and I showed him some of my pictures, and I thought this guy was going to have a heart attack in the place. <laughs> because he had some great pictures, but he had not seen, and I don't think he was really aware of how much of that there, he was an Arkansas guy, and I don't, I don't think he was aware of how much of that architecture there is here. But this is like found architecture. This was a wooden school, and they fortified it with found materials, which was a common thing back then. Sandstone being very common here, and then once they started painting the mortar in between these rocks. It really gave it that giraffe look, and that's it's it's uh, it's a great piece of Ozark's history. Um, these are well, you guys will recognize this one if you're a Taney County person. This is the old Ironside School, uh, which is in Walnut Shade. Uh, I know a lot of you guys go through that way on Highway 160 for cutting through to Forsyth. The bell is still there. It's still there now. I took this picture five or six years ago, if not longer, but this, this one's on its way out. The entire roof on the other side is gone now. Uh, that, I'm told the owner has rejected offers to buy it, um, to preserve it. Uh, it's not long for this world with the roof gone on that side. I'd say probably within a year it'll be, it'll be completely gone, but that goes back to the point of why I do what I do. I didn't get into this to, to sell books. There's not money in that. Uh, what I really am trying to do is go back to that point where my wife didn't get to see the schoolhouse oh, that I took her to see. 
And I feel like there's a lot of other people that want to have this preserved. And if this is the only way you can preserve it, if they're not going to allow people to buy it or take donations to reinforce you know, the structure and keep it alive, then this is the only way you can preserve it. And uh, this is another one that I posted that, and like so many of these schoolhouses, they became churches uh, after the, the schools were closed. So I got a lot of inbox messages from people about how they, the, the wonderful Sunday schools times they had there, the you know, wonderful times they had in school there. And again, that's been the most fulfilling part of this whole decade-long process is, is really finding out more about the history of these, uh, these buildings and how they impacted mm -hmm. our life here. Now this is one that is just right outside town here. Who knows where this is? I know you do. <laughs> this is uh, just off of T Highway, yeah. uh, and uh, this was part of a series I took. I shot all these schools, and same with this one. This is uh, Pine Top. This is Pine Ridge. No, this is Pine Ridge. This is Oak, Oak Grove. Grove. Yeah. Uh, I went out one snowy day and shot all of the ones that were I could get to in a day with my four wheel drive, so I could do a calendar just of these one room schoolhouses with the snow on them. Uh, this one has a lot of history. Uh, Pine Ridge School is up on the old Springfield, Missouri Road, out on the back side of the airport there. Still stands, looks just like that today. It's been very well taken care of. Usually once they put a roof on it, that'll, that'll keep it going as long as they can keep the vandals out. This one, of course, is made of native field stone uh, and has something that's a, kind of an unusual piece. You don't see too many of these uh, tin belfries like this. Uh, that would have been something I was told that they would have purchased maybe from Sears catalog or somewhere and had it shipped in rather than building one like these guys did with this one. Another cool feature on this one is this flagpole is made out of just a big tree limb and yeah. that they put a pulley on onto the top and they just found a big straight tree limb and uh, bolted it down to the peak of the roof and that was their, that was their, where the American flag flew on that. Uh, one of my favorite, that is really one of my favorite Taney County schools. This is another Taney County one here. Uh, this one is called uh, Lone Elm. And this is out on Blackwell's Ferry Road, just off of East 76, mm -hmm. uh, really close to uh, Bull Shoals Lake. This is another one that's been turned into a church at a later time. This is also another one that, as we talked about before, was originally a wooden structure, and they came back and stuck up this with concrete at some point. And as you can see, somebody has come along and put a nice new roof on it and made it durable. I mean, somebody cared enough about this building for it to be uh, taken care of to a point where it's not going to disintegrate in front of our eyes. Mm. Then I have this nice chapter about churches, and I don't know that I have too many in Taney County. I have, uh, this is the Union Chapel in Garrison. I know most of you know where Garrison is. Uh, this is a great old structure. It was built in 1946. Uh, still abandoned, not used at all. Uh, um, here's another one. Actually, I think this might be across the border in Douglas County. Uh, that's uh, Green Valley School. Uh, that's being used as a community church now. It's been well maintained. You all know this one, Sycamore Lock Church. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of you guys have probably even been to church there. <coughs> How many of you guys have been to Theodosia and seen this building? <laughs> this was another one that got really interesting for me. I posted that uh, picture and uh, it had gotten shared quite a bit. And uh, in fact, Caitlin McConnell picked that up and she ended up doing a story on it at another time with some of her pictures. And uh, this is a good story. Somebody posted on there that that was Ledbetter's store and that old man Ledbetter was so crooked that when he died they had to screw him in the ground. <laughs> I had never heard that before. And, uh, some of Mr. Ledbetter's uh, progeny and uh, grandchildren took exception to that description, as you can imagine. And uh, so that led to a very, and I haven't deleted any of it. If you go on my site, you can still see it, but it led to a very lengthy conversation about uh, shopkeeping and ethics and, and name calling and so on. But that building still stands pretty much in its original state. I think I took that in 2012, and I just was through there on my way back from the Ozark Symposium in West Plains, and it looks pretty much the same as it did back then. This is another Taney County. 
uh, Hilda. Uh, do you guys know where Hilda is? Mm -hmm. If you go down, uh, take 76 and go through past Cassie Mills, and from this picture, I got to found, find out that this is actually what they call, the old timers call New Hilda. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. There was another, the original Hilda, and I don't know if anybody's a hiker here, uh, but if you drive down the road that goes to uh, Koi Bald, which is one of my favorite hiking trails, there's, uh, that river used to flood down there so much that they packed up the town and there's still foundations of the original buildings down there, but they moved Hilda up the hill. And there's still a few other buildings around, but this is really the only one. This served as a uh, general store and a post office, uh, and it is an important piece of uh, Taney County history. Uh, this is another good uh, Taney County one in Taneyville uh, that I got a lot of information on when I originally posted it. This was the Casey Brothers uh, feed store and general store, which afterwards was bought by the Gimlin family. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with one of the great grandchildren uh, of the Gimlins who had that store. In fact, she, I gifted her a nice print of that uh, that she shared with her grandparents that they, they were very excited. But this was, this is also still in its very original state. Uh, and you can see that if you drive through Taneyville. It's currently vacant. It was, I think, a flea market when I took this picture, uh, which is why it had these little uh, fringe banners on it. Uh, but that's another one that you can drive around and have a nice look at. Oh, I'll go back to this one. If you're ever in Douglas County, this is a little spot in the road called Denlo. This was a popular general store. It's kind of, if you uh, take five uh, from Ava, like you're driving to Mansfield, you'll, you can see the intersection to 76. If you turn on 76, it's about five or eight miles down that road. But uh, after I posted this picture, I was contacted by somebody who knew all about it, of course. And this upstairs was a meeting place and a dance hall. And apparently they used to have uh, some pretty rowdy uh, parties up in there uh, at that time, back and some parties during the 1920s when some uh, beverages were imbibed there that were at that time not allowed. So that was, a, that was an interesting, very, very uh, cool other little piece of... Uh, Taney County history. Going on down to Douglas County, this is another one. A lot of you have heard of Topaz Mill, uh, which I have some pictures of in here also. But this is the general store at Topaz that was right next to it. The inside of this store is pretty much a time capsule. And it is intact, and everything is still in its boxes. The original casings are in there. The original stamped tin roof is in it. And the gentleman that lives at there, who is the only resident of Topaz, at this point, if you contact him ahead of time, he will let you in uh, to see and photograph anything you want. And he'll tell you chapter and history and verses of everything you would ever want to know about this store and the mill. Uh, and, and that was a popular uh, stopping point for outlaws and travelers and everybody else uh, at, at the time that this was built. And it's, again, a perfect time capsule. Um, Here's another good Douglas County. Who knows this one? Crossroads General Store uh, in Douglas County has been there. Uh, it's also, you're not allowed to go inside. You can peek in the windows. Uh, still has the original colonial bread screen door on the front. Um, feed store was on this side, so there's a ramp going up to this. And again, another example of the uh, uh, giraffe rock uh, masonry that is so popular around here. Uh, and again, another one that I was uh, gifted with information from, from previous owners. And uh, what else do we have? This is a cabin uh, in Kirbyville that was demolished about three years ago. Mm -hmm. I hated to see that one go. I'm glad I got a picture of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a funny story about this picture. My wife was in love with this photo. And uh, I said, well, I'll order a print. And she said, I've got something else in mind. And Riley will remember this, she ordered a shower curtain. <laughs> so I, I had a shower curtain in my house that was this picture that I got to look at. Um, but I did gift a, uh, a print of this to the, to the folks that owned it. Uh, because sometimes I just do that. I felt like they, they, they didn't, I don't feel like they probably wanted to tear it down. Uh, but they did, but they were very grateful to have a, have a picture of it uh, as a keepsake and a memory. 
County. This is the Levi Morrill House. Uh, I shot this in an advanced state of decay. Everybody knows where this was, uh, Uncle Ike's Trail Rides, uh, out on 76, close to Silver Dollar City. Uh, I'm going to say this gentleman here was instrumental in getting the post office moved to the Shepherd Vale site. Mm -hmm. involved in that. And uh, unfortunately, this building, I think, was deemed too far gone to be saved, which is a shame. Because you can see what a great house this was mm -hmm. at the time that Levi Morrill lived in it. Uh, and it was, a, in fact, on the National Registry of Historic Places, mm -hmm. but it just was let go too long. And uh, so this is, again, another one that I was able to document and preserve, at least in photographic form, you know, in its last stages. And if you look online, you can easily find pictures of mm -hmm. Uncle Ike just sitting on porch of this house. And I mean, it was quite a show place for its time. <laughs> And it's another one that is uh, sadly gone that I'm fortunate to have documented uh, before it got away. Okay, this is a good one in Taney County. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of the Brightwell House or the Brightwell family? Okay, the Brightwells came to Taney County around eight, it was after the Civil War, so I'm going to say late 1860s, early 1870s. And this house actually started out as a very small house and grew and grew and grew. Uh, I believe that the best reading I've done about it is from the White River Valley Historical Society. Uh, he was a hardworking man. He had uh, four sons, I believe, that helped him. Uh, the first thing they built, and I did a whole photo series on this house. Uh, that I, I, I would share with anybody that, that wanted to see it. Uh, but this was the biggest and greatest and most famous house in that part of Taney County for many, many years. Uh, a lot of the land that the Brightwell family owned now is under Bull Shoals Lake. You can actually, you can't even see this house from the road now. I uh, had heard about it, uh, read all this interesting history about it, had seen some pictures that were taken in the 1970s of it. Uh, got really interested in it. I went down there, uh, went to the house next door, and said, I really want to take pictures of this house. They're not necessarily the caretakers of it, but they are uh, connected to, acquainted with the, with the descendants of the Brightwell family. And they said, we can't allow people to go and take pictures in it, but you just cannot go inside because it's just too structurally unsafe. And I took some pictures through the door uh, this house was completely abandoned by 1980 or 81, I want to think. Uh, but just sticking my head in the door, uh, in old times when they built these houses, uh, it wasn't a great form of insulation, but they would put, before they would put paneling or siding on the inside of the walls, they would put a newspaper, just like this map is up, and you could see inside there, uh, hanging on the walls where the, 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 plaster and stuff had been peeled back, you could actually see the newspapers from like 1910 and 1911 and re readable uh, that they had put there when they built that particular section of the house. Uh, I want to say this house was added on to six times uh, and there was a smoke house, there's a beautiful old barn that was built from logs that they logged right on the property. It's just an amazing piece of history that I shot that probably seven or eight years ago. I would guess that it's probably collapsed at this point, uh, which is a real shame because that was one of the, uh, that is a very historical property. Uh, but again, one that I was able to, to capture and, uh, uh, and save in that way. Here's one that everybody around here who has some kind of rock and roll information knows about. Who has ever been to the Bagley Homestead? The Bagley Homestead is down by Cedar Creek, and it became famous because on the back cover of the Ozark Mountain Daredevil's Greatest Hits album uh, is a picture of that cabin from the other side. And uh, I got real interested in that, and uh, I did, couldn't find it. Uh, it's off the road, and you have to walk a ways to get to it. And uh, a lot of you guys probably know Mike Webb, the fishing guide. He's a friend of mine, and he said, well, I know where it's at. He said, I'll take you to it. So he did. And uh, that's how I ended up getting some great photographs of this. Well, the descendants of the Bagley family still use that house. It's not completely abandoned. They have a reunion there once a year. And uh, I don't think they reunion much inside of it, but uh, 
there are some pictures, and again, that was a Caitlin McConnell. If you go back and look at the archives of Ozarks Alive, she did a feature about how they gather together every year, friends and family uh, of the Bagleys get together there and have a big cookout, and it's just a cool thing that they, and you can see the, the roof is, I wouldn't call it modern, but it's fairly new, uh, but it's, they've been able to preserve that house because of that. Another interesting feature of this house is it has two fireplaces. Uh, which meant that in those days the Bagleys were probably pretty well to do. So they had one for keeping the house warm and one in the kitchen for cooking. Uh, so that, that's a very, very important piece of Ozark's history right there. And that house is still, like I said, in pretty good shape. That's a Taney County cabin. I can't exactly remember where I took that. <laughs> uh, it was down around Theodosia, but that's an example of a primitive early home that people lived in here in the Ozarks back, back in those days. As far as I know, that one is still standing. And then this is another cabin in Cedar Creek that's uh, in pretty good shape. Then I got interested in barns and mills. And uh, I don't know that I have a lot of Taney County barns on here. This is a good one in Kirbyville. That barn is still there and standing. Uh, that's what they call a, a prairie barn. And uh, this one is uh, at another little ghost town in Douglas County called Arno. Has anybody ever heard of Arno? The general store that was at Arno is still there. It's at a, uh, a confluence of two creeks, and somebody has turned that uh, general store into a house. It's been completely renovated, so it kind of has lost its character as a, what I look for in a historical photograph. Uh, but they have a nice little sign out front that explains what it was and what the community of Arno looks like. And this is the barn that's right behind it that's been there for many, many, many years. A lot of you guys know have been down to Rockbridge, uh, which is a trout farm. This, I took this picture right when they were kind of in the middle of the renovation of that mill. It had kind of fallen into disrepair. I think there's actually a microbrewery in it now and uh, a restaurant that's open seasonally. You can get drinks in there. And then, of course, the, the mill uh, where the trap farm or the, the dam for the trap farm is right behind it. And sometimes I will just take a picture of a little bitty something if it looks like it's uh, photographable, photogenic. <laughs> And then, of course, there's, this is the picture of the Ozark Mill. If everybody got a ticket, uh, we're going to have somebody here at the end of this presentation draw a picture. I uh, think I told you guys, or not draw a picture, but draw a ticket. <laughs> or you can draw this. <laughs> I could not. Uh, that was an interesting, uh, I, I decided at some point about eight or nine years ago that I was going to do a mill calendar. And that's how I kind of got out and started taking pictures of all the mills in southwest Missouri that I could get my hands on and uh, of course I knew about Ozark Mill and can actually remember when it was still operating. It was operating right up until 1993 and uh, I think it was the Hawkins brothers were still operating it at that time and uh, once it came up for sale Mr. Morris who we all know from Bass Pro Shops purchased that property and as he often does he did nothing with it for 15 years. Uh, but so I, I, yeah, he, it, what, when he does get done with projects, they're amazing. Uh, but it sometimes takes a long time for him to, to get to that point. Uh, so I did go up there and take pictures of this. Uh, I did some things I wasn't supposed to do, like pried open the tin and went inside and took pictures of some of the original equipment. I think I told you guys that my day job is up there. And they have a great mill tour now, and they have a lot of that equipment renovated and operational, and you can take the tour and see all that. And it's pretty cool. Uh, another kind of interesting feature about it is, uh, in order to mitigate the flooding issues that they had there, when this picture was taken, it's actually four feet lower than it is now. He, if you take that tour up there, and, and a lot of you probably are aware of how he did this. They, lift, they bought a house moving, brought a house moving company in, they lifted up the entire mill put it on rollers, and over the course of a few weeks, they rolled it a few feet at a time completely off the old foundation. Well, so much flood damage had occurred on this foundation that they just blasted the whole thing out and poured a whole new foundation in, and then the mill itself is now four feet higher than it was at that time. Guess what? It still floods. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
had, had two floods last year. Uh, the the, the uh, restaurant in the basement called The Garrison is uh, was closed for three or four months while they got everything back together. They feel like they've mitigated all those problems. And another interesting piece of this is you can see all of this stamped tin siding. They dismantled that and they took it down and as each one they took down they numbered and they put new insulation and uh, you know, Tyvek wrap and all that, and then they put the individual pieces of stamped tin back in their exact same locations. So it was a very careful renovation, and it's, it's uh, if you haven't eaten there, and if you need a drink, I'm, your, I'm the bartender, so, so, so come on up and get one. Uh, but this is another example of some Ozark history that was well-preserved, uh, an important piece of history. And uh, anyway, one of you lucky guys is going to get to take this home today. Do you want to drop part? I can do because that. I that, need to do a little cleanup and then let you go to Q&A soon. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I, I'm kind of at the end of this uh, as far as the book. Uh, I will tell you this, that uh, if you do want books before Christmas, I don't know when I'm going to have mine. They are available today on Target. Or not Target. That's the only one they're not available on. They're available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and uh, Arcadia's website. So you can uh, visit those and you will definitely get one. And you're going to find some bargains because uh, uh, Thrift Books is already selling discounted copies. And I don't even have, a, I don't even have one yet. <laughs> so, uh, but they are available out there. And like I said, if anybody wants something like this just to have in your computer, you can just Venmo me and I will send it directly to your email box and you'll have a digital copy in your, in your computer. You want to do this and then Q&A? Yeah, and then I just a couple things, a couple announcements that okay. I make, and then Q and A. Go ahead. So, okay. Well, do you want to do your drawing first? <laughs> no, you do okay. your thing. You do your thing okay. first. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> well. Anyway, normally Mr. Babcock does this, but he's not here today, and so just a couple of things. I know with every speaker we get a few new visitors, and if anybody's ever interested, how the museum keeps going is by donations, memberships. And to be, become a member of the White River Valley Historical Society is only $25 a year. I mean, it's nothing. And you get these really cool quarterly mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. And one thing to say about them, if you get this quarters, my grandson actually wrote the railroad article in there. Mm -hmm. And they're always looking for people to write articles. So if any of you know some history in the area, contact them because they need more people to write articles. So that would be fun. And... Uh, I, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to come back at some point just to do even a book signing, but that's uh, something maybe we could offer in the future. I had a uh, quite a few of them planned out for the rest of this year that I've already canceled. This was the only thing I did not cancel because uh, I knew I would sell out. Uh, but yes, the, when the, I will be doing book signings once they're available. Uh, I know that I have a pre-order for myself of, of a couple hundred of the books that I'm going to be taking out and doing different local events and farmers markets and things in the spring and hopefully it will supplement my imminent retirement. Well, and, and since your passion is, is preserving the history, right. say this, this area would be a good one, or perfect. this yep. museum would be perfect for it. And, and lastly, if you saw the quilt hanging in the other room, Mrs. Babcock, who's usually here, they're the curators. She was really wanting this quilt to be raffled off in the drawings a week from tomorrow. So get your quilt tickets, and every penny is also to help, you know, for the museum. Um, and then we'll do Q and A. And I just wanted to thank you for being here because it, wasn't yes. it yeah. fun to have her? <laughs> Would you like yeah. to do the... Sure. Yeah, so get on your tickets. And, uh, also, I tried to stir them up a lot. Okay. You got it? All right. So you got to read your numbers. Oh, I know. I don't have my... Are they sure? Oh, no. Those are shades. Those are sunglasses. We might need some reading glasses. I know what you're saying. 848 Three eight. Oh. Seven four three eight. Oh, Sit right here. Oh, Marie. Awesome. Did you ask me to read your ticket? Nice. Okay. Well, this is yours. Uh, wow. I 
<laughs> he is absolutely <laughs> in love with, with Mills. Oh, well, then this is, then you'll like so this one. Okay, I appreciate you coming. I was born in Jenkins. Oh, yeah, so you know, so I've got and So some, I know a lot about what you're talking about. So Leanne. Uh, oh, yeah, Leanne was his And that uh, beautifully preserved. My, my mother taught in Berry County all of her life. Yeah. In these small schools. I and have uh, a lot of Berry County schools. A lot of uh, stuff that didn't make this book. Ohio, and, where I went to first and third grade. Well, you Lock, saw that. Lock. Did you see it on? Did you have a picture of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's been gone for quite a few years. Oh, no, I'm talking about the uh, the one that the uh, WPA built. And CFO has a real nice one down there. Too. And that's the one star school that used to be in McDowell. Answer a that's few questions. Star, I'm never talking so, star at one time. That was that, that was at McDowell. And then I've got one of uh, Pleasant Ridge. Are you sure? Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I don't this is what's at Clio now. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, you the it? that's the community center. Yeah, yeah. The school is actually about three miles south of there. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, this is school. one, uh, and I know a lot of you guys are familiar with the work of the WPA and all those alphabet agencies yeah. during the New Deal. But yeah, that's when this one was, was built. Um, that's a nice cemetery behind it, too. That's, that's another, again, example of that great fieldstone architecture. I'm open for questions if anybody has any. I'm sure I answered them all already. <laughs> So what happened to the one-room schoolhouse in your parents' property? Uh, the family that owned that name was Kennedy, and they uh, at one point tried to, they, I think it was their kids or grandkids tried to turn it into a home, and that was an aborted project. They, uh, because by the time they tried to do that, it was into the 1980s, and it was kind of unsalvageable to be anything other than yeah, I mean, it just wasn't habitable, and it couldn't be made that way, which is a shame, because the, and I don't know what happened to the bell. I mean, the bell was in that forever, and uh, like I said, when we were kids, we used, the seesaws were still there, the merry-go-round was still there, you know, we'd never experienced a outhouse, and they had like the three holders, which are extremely <laughs> rare, uh, but yeah, it's, you couldn't, you wouldn't even be able to tell it's there now. Um, it's too bad. Do you have any information on Melba? Uh, I do, uh, and I have some photographs there. If any of you guys have ever been to Melba, you guys know that there was a tornado that wiped that town out in 1910? 1920? Later than that. I know it killed almost a whole family, the Box family, which most of them are buried in the cemetery here downtown. And uh, there's uh, some... I've explored that area extensively, and I don't think you can even get to it now that Johnny has bought all that land up. Uh, but there's a famous chimney, uh, and that was the Lucy Woods home, and the story of that is Lucy Woods and another lady, who I think was a school teacher there, stood inside that chimney when the tornado came through, and that's how they survived it. Yeah, yeah I have some pictures of that. Uh, it's an interesting place. Uh, but I don't have any of those, of course, here. To, yeah. Those didn't make the... I, I've, I've often thought about doing a chimney book. <laughs> I, I, I have photographed some amazing chimneys on my hikes and places that I've been around to research here, and that one, of course, is, is one of the best. But I know it well the history of Melva, but there's not much left there to photograph, even if you can access it now. Have you done anything down at Rush, Arkansas? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah, Rush, if you guys are not familiar with that, uh, there's, the, the most famous standing structure there uh, was built as a silver smelter, and so it looks like a big giant chimney made out of field rock out there, and it's sturdy That's and still gorgeous. stands. And the story of that town is that the, they thought, they built a silver mine, they got the stuff out of the ground, they fired up the big uh, silver smelter and found out that it was all zinc. And, uh, so those guys were starving and they supposedly sold all that acreage to a guy for like $10 and some beans because they were literally starving out there. And uh, then World War I came and zinc became a really hot commodity because uh, you know, they, it was used in the manufacture of weapons and a lot of stuff, and so it became a huge boom town. And a lot of the buildings, uh, the general store, the blacksmith shops, some houses, um, are still there. And when 
the Department of the Interior created Buffalo National River that came into part of that area. Well, they've not really done anything to preserve those buildings, but they fenced them off. And uh, if you ever get a chance to visit there, it's well worth it. It's just a small, short hike that you can go around, and they've got signs up that explain what each of the buildings are. I have a lot of pictures of Rush, and I like to kayak down there, too. My grandfather was a miner. He came from western Kentucky with that silver yeah. strike to Rush. And my dad said when they lived in that valley, there was 3,000 people population there. Yeah, and when it's been a ghost town for years. Right? Yeah, it, it's hard to imagine. And if you kind of get off the trail, there was a big hotel there, and you can see the foundation yeah. and the steps. Mm -hmm. You know, it's long gone. Uh, and there's some historical photographs of it. It's it, it's it's definitely a good read, uh, and you can find that on the Department of Interior and the National Parks website. Cool. Uh, but if you ever get a chance to go down there, it's a long dirt road drive right. down there. I like to float to it in a <laughs> kayak, but it's a beautiful place. Yeah, a lot of history there. I'm surprised at how many of the, the buildings are still there. Yeah, considering that they haven't really done any preservation to them, uh, I am surprised because they have, in other places, you're probably familiar with Irby, uh, they did preserve the old church there and a farmhouse and this big, beautiful, uh, what is a dairy barn that are just fantastic, and the Park Service did, and they still maintain them. They're all boarded up, you know, mm -hmm. and you're not allowed to go in. You can actually go in the church, uh, but, uh, yeah, I was a little surprised that they didn't do a Thank little more to preserve that. Rush, but considering Thank that you for loving it. this place. <laughs> oh, I do love the Ozarks. I mean, this, is, this has been, a, you know, important to me to, like I said, preserve the culture and heritage of our, our area. I mean, it seems like... Every generation thinks the next generation is going to forget it, and in a lot of ways they do, but if you can just keep something on record, you know, get people interested, and then they do a little research, and, you know, you, there's a lot to find out there. I'm kind of new to the area. Where is that mill? Ozark, Missouri. Ozark? Okay. Yeah, if you just drive up 65, it's your last stop before Springfield. You just take the Highway 13 exit. You'll see signs for it. Okay. There's billboards everywhere. There's two restaurants in there, banquet facilities. Uh, and then they've got a lot of other stuff on site up there. They bought the old, when the Riverside Inn, which a lot of you folks will remember, and I remember as well, you know, it was condemned by FEMA for flooding. Johnny bought everything in it, all the artwork that Mr. Garrison painted and uh, put it in the basement, at, at, at the basement <laughs> restaurant, uh, which is really cool. And then he also bought the old Riverside Bridge, had it dismantled and reassembled over the Finley River at our location there too. Great place to visit. Finley Farms. Yep. Yeah. Your photographs are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish I could sell you all the book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll buy it. Yeah. Do you have any interest in dog trot architecture and have you run across any? Uh, the last one that I remember seeing was uh, at, it's called, you know where uh, Gay Parita is in Morris County? It's off of Old Route 66. There's a mill there. Britain's Mill, are you familiar with that? So there was a beautiful, well-preserved 1880s era dog trot, trot structure there that was a cabin that was burned by vandals about, I want to say eight or nine years ago. And I, that's another one that I did not get a pic. I remember it from when I was a kid, because you know I'd been down to that mill, but I did not get a picture of, of that one. But yeah, I'm familiar with, with that architecture. My mother in 1947 taught at North Lone Star School. Yeah. Any pictures of that in your book? I do not. Uh, so Lone Star, uh, uh, and this is a good story. I took there's you, of course you guys are probably familiar with the Lone Star Church mm -hmm. that's out there. Yes. Very very old, and uh, I had looked at my map coordinates and found the location, and I that was it. I assumed that I was at, at the right place, and so I posted it on. I have a Pinterest page that's just schoolhouses, and this lady lit me up. Mm -hmm. uh, she was not happy that it's not a schoolhouse, that it's built as a church, it's always been a church. And I'm like, okay, well, direct me where I can see a picture of the schoolhouse, because the coordinates were the same. Well, it turns out that the Lone, North Lone Star Schoolhouse was across that road, mm -hmm. uh, in that field right there, and there's just, you can't even really tell. There's kind of a pile of rubble, and just very, huh. uh, you know, disintegrated timbers there, but that's actually where the school was, so I had to apologize and rename the picture, and you'd be surprised how often that happens. I actually, I have one that I posted this week 
that I took on a hiking trip down in Arkansas, and it was called Roberts Ridge School, and I compared it to other photographs that I found, and the foundation matched, the windows matched, you know, there has been some different work done to it. It's obviously been maintained. And I had a couple guys, and they were nice about it, you know, which I appreciate. And they said, nope, that's not it. That's, that's uh, called Cave Mountain School and Church. And the one you named is actually down the road further, and I did not know that. And, and I appreciate being politely corrected in, in those endeavors. Uh, some people get really upset, you know, if you have misnamed something. And I try, always strive for accuracy. And in fact, that's why some of the things that, I, that made the book... Um, I had some photographs that I thought were maybe a little better that I was a little uncertain about the provenance and, and I didn't want to put something in a book that would be incorrect so I can say safely that everything in the book is researched and correct. Mm -hmm. Yes sir? A couple questions. One, you mentioned one of your favorite hiking trails near Hilda something bald, what is it? Koi bald. Koi bald. Koi? Koi? C-O-Y. C-O-Y, okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a, there, it, it's an out and back, or you could do a loop, great waterfall uh, down at the bottom, which has been bone dry all year, uh, but yeah, if you want to see some great waterfalls that are local, that's a short drive from here, and it's one of my favorite trails. What's roughly the length of the loop? Mileage? What would you say, Mom? Was that eight miles? Eight. Seven or eight miles, yeah, that was the first hike I took her on, and she was not, not thrilled. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, are you, are you uh, familiar with the old structures on Oak Bluff here in Branson? There's an old, uh, uh, what we call the Hermit House, and an old outdoor church with a uh, roof that was, uh, the rumor was it was part of an old camp many years ago. Where's it located? Oak Bluff. No. And it's funny because I've lived here in Taney County for 24 years, and I'm local regardless, but yeah. You need to send me some coordinates. <laughs> yeah, I think you'll find it really interesting. I mean, it's not really similar to, to these structures that you've been sharing with us now, but it's... Yeah, and you know, I will go to these places, and even if I don't find something that... And I don't take pictures of everything I see, you know. I've got to find some character in it, you know. I like them if they're a little not maintained. I like them when they look a little weathered and, and like that. And uh, But even if I don't go and photograph something, I'm always interested in the history and, and the trip to get there, you know. What, what is a way to get in touch with you? Oh, I'll give you a number after, after we're done. And, and you, can, uh, you can message me through my website. So uh, if you see prints you like, I'm adding new prints all the time. My website is abandonosarksphotography.com. Uh, I only do prints this size uh, just because it's too hard for me to edit everything down to smaller sizes. So. Uh, and then you can message me through Abandoned Ozarks Photography on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty responsive on all of that. Yes, ma'am? Does the book include location coordinates for each of the photos or the, the sources no. or not? No, no I don't. And there's a, there's a good reason for that. A lot of, some of these are privately owned. They're on private property and they don't want people to come. And uh, which is another reason why I like to photograph these. And there are a lot of people like me that want to go out, and then there are people who are less scrupulous than me that want to go in. Uh, and I like to go into, and if there's something interesting there, I'm going to photograph it. But a lot of people, I like, I go by the hiking code, you know, de leave no trace. I don't want anybody to know I've not leaving, taken anything from there, and I'm not leaving anything there. And I'm trying to be historically. Preservationist, and so yeah, I don't put, and I, and in fact, on my pages, I don't ever, I very, I just put the county usually or a, a close city, and then somebody will say, Well, how do I get to that? And yeah. I'm like, You know, I'm not sharing that because it's on private property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Yeah, when you were first involved with the Ozark Mill, did you indicate that the mill was operational? Uh, I actually am old enough to have bought feed there. <laughs> you know, it stopped being a flour mill after they had a fire, I think, in the 1930s, and they mostly did livestock feed. And uh, it was the Hawkins Brothers Mill, and I, during junior high and high school, worked on a big ranch uh, in Lawrence County, and 
uh, we would sometimes go up there and take a big flatbed truck and load it down with livestock food. So did they ever let you see the operating itself? Oh, I was in there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that whole building shook like you wouldn't even believe it. it yeah, you just you would think the whole building was going to cave in. <laughs> was there more water there then coming over the dam than now? No, but at that time, the uh, this there's a little structure here, and you can't hardly see it. It's much more visible now. But right here is a thing called a turbine. And so this mill never had a big wheel. They had a wheel that was horizontal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had built this channel on the other side of this, this retaining wall dam that channeled the water into that. And uh, that's what powered that turbine, which in turn powered the augers and everything else that turned the equipment in there. So I, you know, I was... 14 or 15 years old, I wasn't that excited about it. I'm like, let's get this feed loaded up and get out of here. Uh, but I wish I had taken more interest in it then. The Garrison sure. restaurant is right above, is that correct? It's, well, it's the one in the basement. It's a speakeasy. It's an interesting thing. So when uh, you'll see a train car out in the front, right. well, it wasn't a train. It was never a train car. It was a storage tank, and there were two of those in the basement. And when they tore the basement out and poured the new one, they took those out. Well, the one that was in the best shape, they put on train car wheels on a train track so people would understand the history of the old Chadwick line that used to run right there. Uh, the other one, they cut the ends off of it, put it back in the basement, and when you go down to go into the Garrison restaurant, it's got, you walk through that train car to get in. It's supposed to be like a 1920s speakeasy. Highly recommend you get, if you take the tour, it's $5 to take the tour. and. It's mostly self-guided, and it has a lot of historical photos and things like that. I wish somebody from work was here, because I just I told the whole story of the mill. They'd be so happy and proud of me. <laughs> Any other questions? So the, the architecture or whatever that they have in the basement, they were able to get out before the, the floods hit? They got almost everything out, yeah. All the fixtures. Uh, so... <laughs> It's an interesting story. They uh, have submarine-grade galvanized steel doors that are hydraulic that lower down to keep the water from coming in that way. Uh, what they didn't prepare for was backflow. Uh, there's a pump station in the far parking lot that the river got over that, and so basically everything that was in the sewer lines and the gray water lines got backed up in about three feet. So they had to just basically tear everything out. Uh, but all of Mr. Garrison's paintings, all the stuffed animals, all the furniture and everything, they got out before all that happened. Oh, wow. So basically they just report a lot of concrete uh, and some paint and uh, yeah, it's, it's better than ever now. I mean they did some, they were able to change some things around and make it a little easier for those so of us that work there. So they remediated the water? Oh yeah, oh yeah, so actually where that pump station is now, they've got a six foot tall retaining wall around it. And I'm told the backflow for preventer that they put in is the same kind that they use in cruise ships. Yeah. It's that big. So, yeah, it's not ever what happened that time will never happen again. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of money. Thank you, Johnny Morris. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. The old train car, is that the one that used to be at the Civil War cave just north of there? No, it's the, they manufactured that. They, they bought those train it. wheels and they, okay. took that other, okay. they took that other container and just put on top of it. But an interesting thing, they're, you know, they're trying to complete a trail that covers the whole Chadwick line. And they did, uh, they are connected now to the Ozark Springway Trail in Springfield. So you can actually, and it's all paved, uh, so you can actually walk from Lake Springfield to, to the Ozark Mill. It's pretty cool. More good historical preservation. I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, sorry again that I don't have books for you. Uh, We're but sorry for you. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, yeah. thank you so much.